Hello, Story Seekers. I'm Nico. I'm Ben. And welcome to the Tiny Bookcase. Right now, you're listening to our favourite part of the week. Stories, discussions, and a high likelihood of gratuitous obscenities, all to sate the hunger of the bibliomancer Ysteris. Regular listeners will know how it works, but for newcomers, Nico and I have both written a story to the same prompt. We're about to share those stories with each other, and you, for the first time. Then, we'll workshop them on mic. The prompt for this episode is swell. Ben, show me your gross protuberance. Swell. Cynthia was weeding the flower beds when she woke up. Her body felt strange, as though it had been pulled apart and then pushed back together again. Standing, she was confronted by pillars of red blossom from the flowering amaranth before her. Where am I? she thought. The secateurs in her hand were worn in, and she saw the wooden handles were grooved with sweat stains she did not recall making. The garden, too, was unknown to her. Towering cypress trees, tapering like dropped ice cream cones, lined the fence. The rich green of the trees soaked in the summer sun and returned a rich fragrance. They boxed in a small square of cropped grass, which was occupied by four densely flowering beds. The flame-red amaranth neighboured corpse-white stars of asphodel. Bees sashayed from red to white and back again, the resonance of their wings lost to the slight breeze. Cynthia turned when she heard an insistent beeping coming from behind her, and saw a house she did not recognise. A back door and a window were open, and the noise drew her inside. It was a kitchen, the oven bleating with the completion of its timer. Cynthia mashed buttons on it until the alarm stopped, and her curiosity forced her to find out what was inside. A joint of venison, set high on a trivet of root vegetables, crackled and spat at her as it met the humid air of the kitchen. She returned it to the oven and turned the appliance off. I don't know how to cook, though, she thought, and I'm a vegetarian. What what do I know? I remember school, my parents, the time I broke my finger on my bike, my first boyfriend, my first girlfriend, stuffy lecture halls bad grades, grandma dying and intermitting. I remember the way hard music makes me feel soft inside, being hit on in retail jobs and cutting up lines on a mirror until I wasn't having fun anymore. Gap year, graduation, cheap flights to expensive places. I remember being on a date, I think. What the fuck happened? Alfie liked to run with the babies. They slept in the shaded three-wheel buggy in front of him. The heavy-duty wheels he'd installed soaked up the asphalt's friction, and the extra momentum meant he was slaying PBs with every run. The other dads had soon tried to copy him after he smashed them for a few weeks in a row at the neighbourhood park run. I'm basically Lewis fucking Hamilton. You can copy me all you want, boys. Cock swollen from the competition, he monitored his heart rate on his watch as he pushed the babies home. It fell to within normal range after a few minutes, and Alfie felt excited anticipation over the gains he was making on recovery time. The YouTubers he followed said that that was the true sign of fitness. We're back, he shouted as he pushed the buggy through the front door. He heard Cynthia fussing in the kitchen, but frowned when she didn't reply. She always replied. The babes slept on, so he decided to leave them there for a while, and maybe get some use out of the hard-on his win had won him. He stopped dead when he entered the kitchen and saw her face. Cynthia, usually so placid and put together, had been crying. Her eyes were crazed and her brows arched with confusion and panic. Rivulets of mascara stained her cheeks. She had unstrapped her sundress and was examining her breasts. He liked them more now, he wasn't ashamed to say it, but she was pouring at them like there was something out of place. A cold wash of fear flooded his belly and spiked his heart on. He had woken up. Darling, you okay? We've got the Coopers coming over soon. He approached her like she was a wily Mustang. Who the fuck are you? And where the fuck am I? What's happened to my tits? Now, it's all okay. 
it's all okay. Don't fret. It's totally normal for them to change with kids. Let's get you tidied up before dinner. She stared up at him. Kids? Everything's fine, he hesitated, not knowing if he had the stomach to do it again. But the choice between having everything he wanted and that all going away was no choice at all. Everything, well, everything's just swell. Her body relaxed instantly, and her face returned to the calm beauty he loved her for. He watched carefully as she tutted over the state she was in, pulled her dress back up, and carried on preparing dinner. Alfie sighed with relief when she gave him a peck on the cheek. Aren't you afraid he'll use it on you to win an argument? Cynthia was holding a small forkful of venison near her mouth when she woke up again. She dropped it onto her otherwise empty plate, recoiling from the smell. Cynthia was aware someone had said something to her. The woman sat opposite her was beaming with the glow that a glass and a half of wine will give a person. So sorry? I said, Cynthia darling, aren't you afraid that he'll use it on you to win an argument? I would be if my David dabbled in hypnotism. The woman chuckled. I was in the kitchen, she thought. Then a man came in talking about kids. She looked around and saw that man wasn't sat at the table with them. Four places had been set for dinner, and the only other man in the room was older and pudgy. The man I remember was raked thin. He, he said something to me. I, I think I'm not okay. Um, can you help me? She asked the woman. I, I don't know what your name is, but I, I think I'm being drugged or something. I, I don't remember this house or putting on these clothes. Is there a, is there a thin man here? Alfie's upstairs, seeing to the kids. Dear Cynthia, are you feeling all right? The woman reached across to lay a hand on her forehead. You don't feel hot? The thin man, the woman had called Alfie, came back in with the swagger of a showman. Look what a little bird had hidden away. He held a bottle of scotch in one hand and three cut crystal glasses in the other. He stopped smiling when he saw the look on Cynthia's face. Alfie, I don't think Cynthia's very well. The woman spoke over her at the thin man. Cynthia made a fist. She wanted to thump the woman for not believing her. Who am I that she thinks she can treat me like I'm not even here? He's doing something to me. I recognise him from that date. Alfie. She darted her eyes about the dining room, trying to guess where the front door might be from there. I'm going to run out of here screaming. Alfie was all smiles as he said, Oh, don't worry, Geraldine. I think she's just swell. Terrifying. That was... That was really good. The, the perspective switches in that work absolutely fantastic. Thank you. There, there, there's something about that, um, like slotting the two two very distinct, unreliable narrators in between each other, where one doesn't know and one doesn't want you to know. That's yeah, that that worked really nicely as a kind of uh, intrigue sandwich, for lack mm. of a better term. Yeah, I think I think the structure is pretty pretty clear. You know, we we spoke last yeah. week about the. Um... Uh, last episode about about uh, trying to do, get that sort of three act structure in, and um, it, it's pretty even. This one again, it's like you know, beginning her point of view, her inter inter internal monologue, middle him, and then end her again. Yeah. Um, it's. Uh, I, I think that's yeah. fine though. I think you know, there's a reason we're taught that that's the structure of a story because it, it does work. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I mean, I, I think um, I'm definitely not uh, not apologising for it. I think it's more the fact yeah. that it's like it's potentially like too too clear that that's happening. Um, Possibly. Yeah, um, I'm I, not, not um, sure how I'd fix that inside the word count though. Is there anything? But uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think with that amount of time, the the way you told it is good. It's it's difficult to communicate the time jumps. We've actually had this conversation about each other's stories before mm. those those time jumps can be uh it's it's you understand that the time has jumped but it's hard to tell if that was that same dinner or you know i i think you did a good job of that being 
that working for the story like could be a dinner two years down the line it could be a dinner that same night mm -hmm. yeah and um but i think that the, the way that you read that does change the story quite dramatically like if you think it's happening that same night it means whatever's happening is really less effective or is she you know caught in these like huge great swathes of time mm -hmm. where we we don't know so i think if if you wanted to give that clarity i think there might be a way to do it but if if you like it open ended which i think we often do i think that makes it makes short stories more interesting doesn't it if you can go back and read it with a new interpretation then yeah yeah i think for myself i think it, i think it is that night i think you know the yeah the the tag of the venison and things like that like it's 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 happening that night um but I agree that it could be interesting if the, if she has lost more time and it's sort of come back around. This is a regular thing, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I like the idea of his his control degenerating. Like it's she's you know been under his spell or whatever for years, and then twice in one day. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. There, there's a cool kind of uh, maybe it's just my reading it, but like as his focus is shifting onto something else as it shifted onto this fitness stuff it's not being maintained on her and maybe that's why his grip's going or maybe it was... yeah 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 it's i i will say one thing as well i the description at the beginning of the garden was super evocative it was really nice thank you i've been i've been trying to work on um descriptions of nature and stuff recently uh so yeah. i was I, I put quite a lot I, into that yeah i think um things like describing uh, flowers by their shapes instead it really helps to paint that picture it gave a a really clear idea of the space we were in and mm -hmm. then it made the the little rug pull where all of a sudden she's like where the fuck am i <laughs> what the fuck's <laughs> happening it does give it that because you are sort of oh well this is nice what a pretty garden to have yourself then put into a a situation like that was yeah it was really i think i think just just well done just well handled Thank you. I think one of the things I was keen to get there was that, um, you, you know, you often find it, well, you don't often find it, but you sometimes find it in, in the way that people write uh, fiction and, and, and non-fiction to a certain degree, but, but the paying, um, if, if you're limited, your, if you're sort of tying your narration to a character's point of view and they just over-describe everything around them, people don't really do yeah. that on a no. normal day. Like, they do it when they're in distress or if they're in a new place or whatever it is. So I was quite keen to set it up instantly that she didn't know where she was. And then yeah. you get the sort of the more in detail description of the garden because she is looking to try and understand where she is. Let's um, to piece it together, yeah. Yeah, rather than it just being like a page of description about how, you know, the sun is setting and all the rest of it. And then you meet the character. It's like describing things semi-tied to the character is the idea. Um, so... Another thing that isn't immediately obvious, and I think it would have to be a really deep cut for people to get this, so this is why I'm sort of talking <laughs> about it now, is that um, something a bit strange happened to me after I after I started writing this, because I had the idea for the character name. I thought I wanted it to sound a bit floral, so and it popped into my head, Cynthia, and I had this idea of this woman who was being controlled using a... Um, you know, like a, a hypnotist word, you know, how they can like break people in and out of trances and stuff like that. Yeah. Or supposedly they can. I, d I have no idea whether I actually believe that, but I, d I definitely don't want anyone to test it on me. So, um, but, uh, and I had this, like, the idea came from this idea of like, you know, things are swell, you know, like what if they're not? And what if that's the control word Yeah. in order to keep them swell? Right. So that's where it came from. And it could have been just that. But then I, I just sort of thought, I'll just look up what Cynthia means. And it turns out that Cynthia is another name for the goddess Artemis, or Diana if you're Roman. Um, and Artemis has a bunch of stories in her mythology about men trying to like uh, attack her, either like to capture her or sexually assault her or whatever it is. So I kind of built the structure of this around that trying to get this idea of like she could be this you know embodiment of womanhood that has been trapped here or yeah. she could be a person so the things like the flowers like the amaranth and the asphodel and the cypress trees to a certain degree are all objects that have 
pertinence to Ars- to Artemis's story. Okay. Um, and uh, the deer is also her animal. Yes. Um, so her being a vegetarian and the fact that she's cooking a joint of venison is like she's she's being forced to completely transgress her nature. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like the these things are just coming up naturally because I sort of wanted to give this idea of like it's almost like her inherent uh, femininity or her, in, her inherent identity is still is like pushing up even in the garden like she subconsciously she's picking the flowers that are going to sort of like help to wake her up or whatever yeah um and then alfie is a name that's from one of the character one of the male characters that's pursuing her in the artemisian myth oh um, that's cool and he so, was uh, he was a real piece of shit by the way yeah yeah to just walk into your house and be like well my dick's hard i better find my wife and use that <laughs> come on bro <laughs> Well, that's the thing, isn't it? You know, it's it, it's like he's got this like fifties idea of what, yeah, homemaking is, rather than actually and rather than actually having a real relationship with anybody, he's just mentally controlled someone and and put them into a box that he's comfortable with and that he can abuse. Um, the uh, hypnotist is such an interesting story element, aren't they? Because it is really easy to make them super hokey, and you end up with like that character from Little Britain, don't you? Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. The, um... But I think, yeah, I, th- I think you you toe the line well here because it's got more of like a like a sleeper agent feel mm-hmm. than a uh, you're feeling very sleepy thing. So, yeah, I think yeah, I, th- I think it does work. I think I get the impression because I I wrote the line, um, you know, this the uh, Geraldine Cooper, this um, this female character that sort of doesn't understand what's happening at the end. Yeah. Um, she says I that she would be afraid if her, her husband dabbled in hypnotism so the implication yeah. there is that alfie is just dabbling in it it's not his job if that makes sense so i've sort of got this idea yeah. in my head that he's like a maybe he's like a like a psychotherapist or something that has added that on or yeah, yeah i don't know it's it's um yeah it was it was a lot of fun it's just one of those ones where it was just sort of you, you start writing something and then the the name that pops into your head happens to to gel entirely with the concept that you already had. And I then all of a sudden it's still like a depth. Yeah. I've got to start Googling the names of the characters I come up with now in case I'm accidentally doing it. So <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's a thing. Like, you know, names um names have meanings. They and they they also have like uh, connections to like rich storytelling traditions. Um so it's great. I mean there's this uh, website called Behind the Name, uh which I use quite a lot. Um, yeah, for various reasons, and it's just nice, sort of seeing like the fact that we're all sort of interconnected in some way. Because you you always find out that like a name has eighteen different variants across all these different countries and and languages that that use it. Um, yeah, and it it just makes you feel a bit more connected to the to the human race. I think. And then you find out that loads of the mean things like grey and rock. A lot of like yeah. kings and stuff like that. You know, people that. Yeah. Have, yeah 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 um so <clears throat> i had fun with that one um it, but it is chilling and it's unpleasant so hopefully it didn't freak anybody out but um there we go well, that was what happened when i when i got swole so uh let's see what <laughs> you do. let's find out swell modern life can be pretty tricky right Here at Miles of Smiles, we know better than anyone just how magical the power of a smile can be. If you're struggling with bills, unsatisfied at work, or suffering with one of those nasty mental health illnesses, why not turn that frown upside down? Join our Miles of Smiles realignment program today for 12 weeks of guaranteed improvement or your money back. If everyone smiled, wouldn't that be swell? Readjustment programmers were the in thing. It started with debt consolidation. It squirmed its way into comprehensive healthcare plans, and soon the roots of the insidious plot to micromanage the weak willed have begun drinking from every pool available. Happiness was a commodity which was at an all time low. 
and, as with all things rare and necessary for human survival, some bright spark monetized it. My breakup with Lila had been pretty bad. Her deciding that lesbianism really had been a phase after we'd lived together for three years was, let's say, strong. I still didn't know if it was a game that she'd felt like playing or if she just met someone else and it was the only excuse that she could manage. And either way, it left me in a fucking hole. Because suddenly I've got a place I can't afford on my own and I'm labouring under this presupposition that nobody cares about me. My parents were fine. They were off-world. They traded in their remaining work years for biomass cycling and gone off-planet. I'm not jealous. I actually think drifting through the void would be shit. Especially in a body that's 20 years older than it thinks it is. But I guess good for them. I miss them. Sometimes. I think that's how they got me. The miles of smiles, people. I needed to talk to someone. And there that ad would be. It was like clockwork. In between every song, there would be a bulletin break and an ad. The targeting was pretty spot on. Not for the music, that was whatever drivel they were pushing, but the ads. They knew your age, your taste, your mood. Snack food ads at lunchtime, obvious. Sex worker commissions on your stagger home from whatever squalid den of iniquity you've spent the night in. But for me, all of the damn time, these depression cure ads. If everyone smiled, wouldn't that be swell? No one smiles, not in the workplace. I look into people's cubicles, no one is ever smiling. I make my coffee. Someone inevitably asks if I've ever tried real milk. They tell me how good it makes coffee taste. I don't even use the powdered shit, so I just say no. And even when they're telling me how magical milk is, they don't smile. The transport grid pilots don't smile. The, the ones that still have human faces, I mean. Or the folk working behind the bars. And definitely not the ones on my side of the bar. So I don't know how it would be if everyone smiled. But I keep hearing the ad, and I'm thinking about when at least I used to smile. And I miss her. No, I miss me. <laughs> the me before everything was shit. Their interview process was short. Pre-existing conditions, any bio-sanctions placed on your organs. Oh, imagine if some harvest baby just wandered in and realigned and didn't want to give their guts up. Wild. Do you have any suicidal thoughts? Do you believe in any of the following sanctioned deities? Will you sign here, please? The guy interviewing me was smiling. His teeth were shiny like they had lights inside of them. Every time he spoke, it made me squint a little. We'll make plenty of friends in here. Won't that be swell? Loneliness is a disease. And here, we believe in curing the sick. I gave him a half-hearted, yeah, while I pressed the buttons to give my answers to the interview. The question about deities had given me pause. I hadn't heard of half of these things before. I wanted to ask what the fuck a Jezus Christ was. I thought better of it. Are you okay, Molly? You seem to be struggling with some of the questionnaire. It wasn't a question. I shook my head. No, I was fine. I'm just a slow reader. Well, we can practice some reading, Molly. Won't that be swell? Do you have any hobbies, Molly? I muttered some nonsense about how I like to paint, which was half true. I like making mess. It's terrible at actually painting anything that looked sensible or real. He was still talking in that eerie cadence, like his brain was pre-recorded. But I didn't listen. I'd been transfixed by the page I was reading. It was page eight of eight. Do you suffer any of the following maladies? Liver failure, atmos poisoning, psychosis, heartbreak. Heartbreak? Why was that in there with the serious sicknesses? And this smiling man is just staring at me like he knows I've just read it. Like they know I was coming. So I 
pressed it. I pressed it because my heart was broken, wasn't it? It can kill people. They've told me that in here. Heartbreak can kill you. When I finished the forms, the first thing they did was hug me. The smiling guy and then a couple of others. I was passed like a hug baton through the hallways of what was going to be my new home. You can play air hockey in here. Won't that be swell? Get your own private room. Isn't that swell? It's time to find the new you. Won't that be swell? I didn't want the new me. I wanted the old me. I miss the old me. I miss being silly. I miss watching raindrops burst on the neon outside our window and pretending it was ships at war beyond the oxygen rim. I missed feeling like I was somebody. And they shaved my head. When I got in, I realised that everyone was shaved. Everyone who wasn't smiling. Beauty, they said, is a privilege. Looking nice, being styled, these are things that have to come later. You have to learn to smile at your lowest, to be able to find the happiness in everything. So I tried to find some happiness. They gave me painting equipment because of my interview, and I learned how to paint. I could make shapes, and then I understood colours, and then I started to get good. And one of the ladies I was in there with offered to be my model. And I painted her exactly as she was, and then added back what I imagined her hair would look like. Red like her eyebrows, and long, hanging over her shoulders, framing her perfection. Her name was Evelyn. I smiled for a while. Evelyn had bought it back. I would run my hand over the ruby red fuzz on her scalp between the weekly shavings. We would steal kisses. You weren't to go into each other's sleeping space. Only in the shared rooms could we mingle. And that anticipation of it, the forbidden nature, the fact we could never actually fulfil our lust gave our romance an urgency. We would pleasure ourselves at night and describe it to each other in the morning. We'd laugh and act shocked at each other's words. And we would smile. And then Evelyn was gone. And when I asked her corridor mates, no, or why, and the star said she's been advanced, she'd be allowed to grow out her red hair, and she'd be moved to another set of dormitories to reflect that. Been moved because she was smiling. Wasn't that swell? The thrill of self-pleasure was numbed when there was no one to explain it to in gory detail. Started to suffer when I no longer had a willing model. They didn't give me my allowance of materials. So I tried to make art with what I had left, which they liked, but I didn't. Don't really know how many days it's been since I joined the programme. The lack of windows makes it hard to tell. The stark white of all of this place dotted occasionally with my scrawled art is making me feel wrong. I miss Evelyn and I tell my smile negotiator that. They tell me I'm in a cycle of codependency that is unfair to base my need for happiness on another person. My response gets my remaining art equipment taken away but the negotiator's nose will never be the same again. Meeting my new negotiator tomorrow morning. They're going to start me again, they say. I'm clearly so low that it's the ideal time to start readjustment. You can practically hear them smiling through the door as they talk about me outside it. I'm going to make myself smile if it kills me. I want to see the stars and the neon and Evelyn. Won't that be swell? Deeply chilling. Hey, Emma. Yeah, how, did, how did we both land in a very similar area? Really, though? really similar. The both swell. Using, the, using swell in that way. Yeah. I, it, yeah. Yeah. Liked it. Um, liked it a lot. It, 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 it did that thing that I think all good stories do where they sort of 
remind you of lots of different things, but they are they are their own thing as well. Yeah. I've said thing too many times, but you know what I mean. Um, yeah. <laughs> the thing. You did the thing. Well done for doing the thing. Ah, um, I you the thing. <laughs> um, but opening with that like uh, dystopic like advert, the Miles Smiles thing, the this idea of like a, a debt consolidation happiness rehab is fucking great, by the way. Really, Thank really you. good. Um, very imaginative. But also, um, it reminded me a lot, not of Blade Runner, but of Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep instead. Yeah. So the yeah, that, book, not okay. the movie. Um, all of the off-world stuff, the even that thing at the start where it was like she was looking for a way to alter her state, and it it sounded like there was going to be like a technological way to fix that, um, because because Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep opens with a whole series sequence of scenes about what's called a Penfield mood organ, yeah. and uh, it's all about just being able to like type in you know seven three one into it into the keyboard. And then you get like sexual ecstasy, uh, eight seven five, and you get like existential dread. You know, like you can just yeah. have whatever you want from it. Whereas this was more drilled in. You know, you you were hyper focused on the on the the smiles and the swellness of being able to smile, which worked really well. And then also, I thought it reminded me quite a lot of um, Burning Chrome, like the you know the William Gibson cyberpunk startup. When you're talking about. Yeah. Um, the lack of real foods, like the milk and stuff like that. Um, and again, also, these are two things that that are connected, because obviously Ben and Chrome um, inspired the, the Blade Runner movie and etc. like that. It, um, yeah. Those are all together. But then also, you also got uh, some V for Vendetta in there as well. Yes, that was... Uh, I, I realised after I'd written it that I called that character Evelyn yes. and then went, oh, that's Evie. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and with the shaved heads and the you know forming that attachment whilst in uh, imprisonment. Yeah. Um, but again, I'm not saying any of this because it was like, oh, that's where you ripped that from, you yeah. stupid thieving bastard. It's not that. It's it's that it makes a lot of sense that you know you've been in, you've been exposed to this and it's filtered through and it, you've created a really interesting story with it with a. With a a very tangible world that is your own um, mm. and reminds me of other things that I like, um, which is really nice. Loads of great turns of phrase in there. You know, you've got like this idea of like harvest babies and oxygen rims. These are things that, these are words that we know, but you're, yeah. you're abusing them until they are things that we're uncomfortable with. This idea of ships yeah. beyond the oxygen rim and harvest babies yeah. refusing to be, ha be, you know, harvested. I think the, uh, the most chilling one for me when I was sort of adding these terms in was talking about what our parents had done. This idea that they could say, well, you're, you know, you're 20 years from retirement, but if you want, we can take the sort of biological potential of those 20 years from you yep. to, to use in our systems. And then you can just retire now mm -hmm. and people being like, yeah, that sounds good. But that, that to me is the most terrible because it's, a lot of the time it is what, sort of working in office feels like isn't it is that you sat yeah. down and then you're like oh i just lost a year and i don't know where it went <laughs> and that's also got a bit of a matrix vibe to it maybe you know this idea yeah. of like just being like plugged into you're a battery that people can expend your resources from um yeah very very unpleasant and um also that you sort of played a little bit you know talking about similarities again with that passage of time because they you know they have lost 20 years and they're yeah. waking up and things have changed. Their bodies are different, but their minds are the same. Um, yeah, that, that's in fact that's quite an eerie similarity, actually, isn't it? Yeah, um, it's. I mean, it's it's always interesting when we land in a very similar place, mm -hmm. and it's especially when, like, I know at the moment we're consuming very different media, so there's not yeah not that much um, external force being applied to it. It's, no. uh, yeah, uh, it's uh, something about the word swell makes us think, oh, <laughs> swell, swell is what Americans say for good, and it's not. <laughs> and it's not good. Nothing's aren't good. <laughs> Everything's yeah. bad. Um, the concept of a smile negotiator was hilarious. Like, yeah. I think that's, that almost needs to be, like, I would imagine if this was like a TV show, that would yeah. become like a viral thing that people would have on like T-shirts and things like that. Like this idea of a smile negotiator—it's fucking <laughs> horrible. 
Um, yeah. I I felt like the 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 Jezus Christ joke was just for me. I don't know whether that was. Uh, I, I... It was. I I liked the idea that that most religions had fallen into sort of disuse as we've mm -hmm. become so biologically flippant. That it was like no one cared about souls anymore. It's like what what can I spend my yeah. organs on? I was like, well, you sort of a lot of religions would be. Uh, obliterated by that sort of obliterated but then these people would be like okay are you in one of the sanctioned religions do you like make sure you check mark it otherwise we might do something that goes outside of your religion to you without asking well i, I actually I, read that as like because they're a cult they were like we they wanted to know what your cult history was oh that's so, interesting like yeah. so it was it was actually like they, they didn't want to give you a pastor that you had already been used to indoctrinate you before Oh, that's dark. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah that, that was that was immediately where I went with that. I was like, oh, <laughs> fuck, that was dark. Um, but yeah, this idea of a corporate cult is yeah. that next level of fear, isn't it? Like having sort of emerged from, uh, you know, as 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 a you know, humanity has a, is beginning to emerge from this nonsense. The idea that the next thing is, you know, you might end up in like a YouTube cult or something yeah. like that. Um. Yeah, really yeah. unpleasant. The um, just the one one thing that I that I really enjoyed, which is sort of separate yeah. to the storytelling, was the description of the teeth, shiny like lights inside of them, and you do, I'm I feel like once someone points this out to you, you start seeing them everywhere. When if you watch any kind of like in particular like American, uh, media, yeah, everybody's got veneers. Yes, and. Or at least that's what it seems. And sometimes they're like almost blue. They're so white they're almost blue. It's like, yeah, that's not what teeth look like. Got the turkey teeth, mate. Uh, yeah, but but they're you know I'm not saying that you know there's some very attractive people that have them and all the rest of it. Like it's it hasn't. But it's almost like the it's there's a, like a there's a there's a very slight bit of uncanniness to them, which I think you've honed in on and used really well here in this unpleasant dystopic society that you've built it's you know a, that's yeah. that's a thing it's almost like a cyberpunk body mod isn't it the mm -hmm. the teeth that people are getting yeah and it's it's where those things everything gets pushed to the extreme like do you remember i remember lip filler starting to be a popularized thing about 10 15 years ago and now it's just something people go and get done the same as you get your nails done you can get botox and lip filler done and that, to me, like, the normalization of altering your physical attributes like that, it's, you know, it's your body. Fine, do what you want with it. Like, I'm someone with a couple of tattoos. It's your body. But it's also a little bit frightening because those are not, like, clinical spaces mm. and you're having chemicals injected into your head. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that is deeply disturbing. Um... <laughs> I, don't think I don't think there's a way around that. Um, I suspect, you know, it probably can be done very well and nicely yeah. and all the rest of it. But yeah, I've, uh, I have, I, I think definitely as I've gotten a bit older as well, and you just sort of, you sort of know what you like, if you know what I mean. Yeah. And then you sort of watch trends come out of the, the various different, um, cultures that we're aware of around the world and then watch them like sweep the globe or whatever and just be like i think i'm gonna sit this one out um, yeah, I... i'm doing that more and more i feel i don't know whether maybe i'm just lapsing into being a cave person i don't know but it is uh... <laughs> I, I definitely like every so often there's uh to date this to time stamp this for everyone there's a meme that's very popular at the moment of a young lady saying hawk to her <laughs> and i just i don't Obviously, I get the joke, but I don't understand why that has become so wildly popular. And maybe it's because I'm turning into an old man and I'm just not down with the youth anymore. <laughs> but I'm like, OK, yeah, it's it's funny, but it's not. Stop the planet funny. Yeah, I, I can sort of see what you're saying. I think there's still a degree of like sexual repression just generally. So yeah. um, in, in, in Western civilization. So I think that is... Maybe what that? Maybe that's why it's bitten so hard. I don't know. Hey, that, uh, that pretty girl there is talking about spinning on dicks. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think maybe there's like an acceptance that um, 
there's like a like a, a cultural relax like out breath about like everyone's into that kind of thing that's fine like now we can move on but it's a joke I'll tell you, yeah i'll tell you yeah. a thing that i i've become really focused on recently and i'd love to have a play around with it with yourself at some point maybe we can even do it on mic I, i'm not letting you it's... spit on my dick that's not happening. no <laughs> hawk to her no <laughs> um no it's um so i got really into looking at like modern youth slang right so like gen z slang and looking at the way that words are being transformed and it really got me thinking about like what's english going to look like in 50 years 100 years mm-hmm. yeah you know, where where are the changes going and part of me wants to go like full clockwork orange with it and write a sort of speculative fiction that uses yeah. that language because they're like even now even in our lifetime some words are changing so much and the you know people saying oh that's an l that's a w that that could and then that became that's a dub and now people refer to to winning things as oh that's a dub mm. and that that will just become a word in, in of its own strength and you know we're witnessing the history of the change of language yeah lexical language. shift and stuff like that is is absolutely absolute uh, i think they call it drift actually like abs- absolutely hilarious yeah. um but also like I've also witnessed it not happen as well. You know, okay. you know, things things fall out of use in the same way that they can fall into use. Um, you, you know, things that like nobody says "peng" anymore. No, <laughs> and that was That's that was true. a big thing for a while. Um, a uh, there was Good also decent. like w- when we were um, a bit younger, there was that um, that wave of fear that emojis were going to take over. Oh yeah, language. I do remember that. And that we were going to end up with like hieroglyphics of emoji faces and stuff like that. But you know, I I I have yet to see a, like a a professional work email with a, with a like a like too many emojis in it. You know, like maybe one or two, but they're not. They haven't taken over. Um, I think it's really interesting that you're talking about this now because that was really evident in your story that you were already playing with language. You were you yeah. were creating new ways that language could be interpreted interpreted but i think you could go one step further i mean I, i'd be up for listening to it if that's your next story like you know if you go for like a uh just a complete clockwork orange attack on language yeah i think that would be really cool really say cool. things like uh he's been risen the skibbity toilet as he pulls a knife <laughs> or whatever it is that young people yeah. say <laughs> <laughs> i assume it will be entirely incomprehensible to me because you're way cooler and hipper than i am <laughs> so, as I, uh, evidenced by what i just said but i think i just watched too many memes <laughs> that's the that's the truth <laughs> and i said what on earth are they what does he mean spinning glizzies and then i have to google it and then i know <laughs> oh that's really good i uh i really enjoyed your story and um I enjoyed telling my story, so yeah, thanks again. I thoroughly enjoyed listening to it. I think um, one thing that we should just um, talk about briefly is that um, our release schedule has shifted a little bit, um, and we're now doing still regular episodes, but we're doing uh, fortnightly, so every two weeks. And there's a few reasons for that, but primarily uh, it's because uh, we've both got quite a lot on at the moment, and also I'm taking a pretty serious swing at... Um, getting uh you know books written and uh, approaching literary agents and things like that so it may seem like a uh like a slowing down of content from our from the from the tiny bookcase but i think it is something that is going to be beneficial to it in the long run so yeah it's yeah. think think of it as lots of little stories being missing so that ben can load them into one <laughs> super full novel size story and then hit you with it later yeah pretty much so yeah, so thank you for listening, everybody. Uh, we, you know, we love it. We see it, um, you know, through the metrics and everything that we get that we get. That we know that people are all over the world listening to this, and it's, uh, it's brilliant. We love doing it. We love telling stories together, and we're going to keep doing it. Right, come on, back in bed, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us for this episode of the Tiny Bookcase. Remember to subscribe, otherwise you're going to miss out on the future fun. Also, tell a friend. If you liked this episode, link them to it. We'd be tremendously grateful. You can follow us on Twitter at Bookcase Tiny, Facebook at The Tiny Bookcase, and Instagram at Bookcase Tiny for updates.
Speaking of supporting the podcast, well, magic can only take one so far. The tiny bookcase is supported by the generosity of its patrons. Those kind souls have really kept my belly full the last year. Let's cast a spell for them, shall we? For rich ginger tones on their scalp, let us cast the Orangi Hedondo spell for Scott Byrne. And for general fabulousness, why not the Ula La Alge Mother spell on Matthew McLaren? <laughs> How do you come up with that shit, man?